You may be seated. What makes Christmas significant? I know we're in church. Everybody knows the answer is Jesus, right? But what makes Christmas significant to you? What makes Christmas have value in your life? Christmas, the story, is true, no matter what. But if you lack one thing, then Christmas will lose all value to you. To illustrate, uh, Sherilyn has decided to take up beekeeping. Now, if you know anything about Sherilyn, you know that she's very, very afraid of being stung by wasps and by bees. So whenever she came and said she wanted to do this, I thought, well, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll see what this is. I, I tell you, she has just really gotten excited about this, gotten into it. She's learned, she's studied about honeybees and what they're like, what they do, how to take care of them. And uh, really, it's been a lot of fun just watching her excitement uh, over this. Uh, and I like honey, so, you know, I'm good with it. Uh, at the end of the day, we're going to get lots of honey, right? So, um, I don't know, a few weeks ago, got a box from Amazon, uh, one of many, and in this box was her bee suit, her pink bee suit, <laughs> because if she's going to do it, she's going to look good, is it? And I know I'm a little biased, but I, I will say she, she looks adorable in her, in her bee suit. So she modeled her bee suit for me, and I just thought, oh, you look wonderful, cute, adorable. So I assume the bee house is on the way, the beehive. She said, no, I haven't ordered it yet. I thought, well, I mean, the bee suit looks good, but, you know, without the beehive and everything, I mean, she could go check the mail in the bee suit, I guess, but, you know. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to order it. So a few days ago, another box from Amazon, again, one of many. And in this box is the beehive. And so now we have in our house... A beehive and a bee suit. Or a pink bee suit, yes. And it's great. It's wonderful. But we're still missing something. <laughs> because at the end of the day, while she could go out to her beehive in her bee suit without bees, what's the point? This morning, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1. We're going to continue to try to get your pastor out of my bah humbug mood that I've been in with Christmas 2020. Last week, we talked about the joy of Christmas, that Christmas is a reason for rejoicing, and we looked at the things that we can rejoice in as we started uh, looking at, at Luke's account of the birth narrative. Next week, we're going to talk about the peace of Christmas, that Christmas is about peace and how that peace comes about and what that peace actually is. Christmas can be about joy and can be about peace, but it, it has none of that for you, and it does none of that for you if you do not have faith. So this morning as we continue Luke chapter 1, we're going to talk about faith, about trust, not merely faith of I believe this is true or this happened, but about a surrender of one's will and one's life to the Lord Jesus Christ and entrusting of oneself to God. This is what faith is. You can have a bee suit and a bee hive, but without bees, you're going to get no honey. You can talk about Christmas and the joy and the, and the peace, but without faith in Jesus, you have nothing. So, as we begin looking at faith this morning in this passage, let's go to the Lord and pray and ask him to open our eyes to see what he would have us see in this text. Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, creator and sustainer of all things, we come before you to give you praise, worship, and the honor that is due. For you are God. By your will, all things existed 
By your will, they continue to exist, and by your will, they will come into completion of the purpose you've set for all things, that you might be glorified above all. And I pray that this morning we would be able to partake in that purpose of creation, that we would be able to glorify you, not just through our singing, but now through the proclamation of your word, and not simply through the speaking, but through the hearing of your word, that our hearts would be receptive, and that we would elevate and magnify you in our lives, and our in our heart, and and God, we pray that you would bless us with the faith to be able to respond to these words with obedience. We praise you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you for coming, the light of the world, for piercing through the darkness, the darkness that seems so overwhelming and, and oppressive, and yet it flees at your presence. So, our Lord, we ask for your presence now. And we might, in your light, learn and grow. That we might, in your light, be transformed. I pray this in Jesus' name. And for his glory. Amen. Luke chapter 1. We saw last week the precursor to Christmas is the coming of John the Baptist. And and, and the joy that the birth of John is going to bring. We saw how God is giving us a taste of what's to come as he restores life and honor and dignity to a barren woman. And we're going to read another tale this morning, another story of an angel visiting a person to tell them about a coming conception and birth. And uh, what we're going to read this morning very much parallels what we read last week between John the Baptist's uh, announcement and the announcement of Jesus And Luke does this uh, intentionally to show us the the similarities between what happened in the events um, so that we can see the connection between Jesus and John, but also the dissimilarities, the things that were different between what happened with Zacharias being told about the coming of John and Mary being told about the coming of Jesus so that we can see that while John and Jesus are connected, they're also very distinct. And that distinction, as you read through the Gospels, is shown in the fact that John comes to call people to repentance in preparing them for the Lord, and Jesus the Lord comes offering salvation to those who are willing to listen to John's message and repent. And so Jesus is by far the superior in the two, between the two, and we'll see that this morning as we look at some of the differences uh, between the two accounts. So verse 26, if you'll begin reading with me, Luke chapter 1, verse 26 it says, now in the sixth month, this is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Uh, we read last week that she kept herself in seclusion for five months, so she's coming out of seclusion at this point. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, same angel we saw last week, he was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. Uh, So let's see the, the, the stage that's being set here. Elizabeth has miraculously conceived, is in her sixth month of pregnancy. Uh, so what God said would happen with Zacharias and Elizabeth is taking place and We see the angel Gabriel sent out on another mission. He came to Zacharias as the angel who stands in God's presence with the good news of the coming of John the Baptist. And now he's being sent somewhere else. But but see the difference. If you remember last week, the angel was sent to Zacharias while Zacharias was in the temple of God in Jerusalem, in the most glorious, spectacular place in Israel. This is the most honorable place to have an angelic revelation. Now the angel Gabriel is sent not to Jerusalem again, and not to even any place of significance, but up into Galilee to a little town called Nazareth. We know very little about Nazareth, whether we're talking about archaeology or simply historical records or from the Bible itself, but what we do know about Nazareth is that it was insignificant. It was looked down upon. We see in the Gospel of John where Nathaniel's like, really, anything good come from Nazareth? Nazareth was a place of insignificance, and the angel is sent there to deliver his next message. Next, we're told about this 
virgin named Mary who's engaged to a guy named Joseph who happens to be a descendant of David. Now, biblically, we would think, hey, that's really cool. That means a lot that Joseph is the descendant of David. It certainly does. But from the world's perspective at this time in, in history, the line of David had lost all power and honor. It was an impotent line. And so when we say that Joseph is the descendant of David, we're not supposed to see from a worldly perspective a man of any real significance in the world. After all, he's a carpenter who's based in a town that nobody even knows about or cares about. And so she's engaged to a man who could have some value, but really from a world's perspective is fairly insignificant, being void of any political power whatsoever. And then we have Mary herself, the virgin engaged to Joseph. We don't know much about Mary, but if they went according to, to normal age requirements, she was probably a young girl. Uh, people suggest anywhere from 10 to 14 years old. The Romans had a law that a girl could be engaged once she was 10 years old. She could not be married until she was 12. Think about doing that today. That's insane. But that was their rule. That was their law. And, and from everything we can tell, the Jews followed very similar age requirements. So Mary was at least a young teenage girl when she's engaged to Joseph in a little town of no significance to a man who has no power in the world. This is her situation in life. This is the glory and magnificence of the Virgin Mary from the world's perspective, nothing. But this angel of God who stands in the very presence of the Almighty comes to her and says, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. This greeting does not match her station in life. And that's important to keep in mind. When he says greetings, it's a word, some of your translations may read rejoice. And uh, it's a word that is typically used for greetings, salutations, hello, how you doing kind of uh, word. But its basic meaning is that of joy. And it's also translated grace. And we're going to see this word uh, all throughout this text this morning, words that are related to it of joy, of grace. Uh, it's a very, very highly emphasized word in this text. Uh, he comes to her, and he's, it could simply be a greetings, or it could also be uh, its more deeper meaning of rejoice. And he calls her favored one. Now, this is not like our Catholic friends believe that she is full of grace and thus able to bestow it. It's a passive verb, meaning that she has received grace, that she is favored by God and filled with the grace of God as God's benevolent act towards her. She has no grace to bestow on others. She is a recipient of God's grace, and we see part of that grace being displayed in the fact that he says the Lord is with you. The Lord Almighty, his presence and his purpose is with you, Mary, young, insignificant girl at an insignificant town engaged to a fairly insignificant guy. God himself is with you. And I think what we're supposed to see here is that the magnificence of Mary is seen in the grace that God is giving to her in this moment. Mary is certainly a hero of the faith in that she responds to God's word with faith but she is not, as she has often been made out to be, a bestower of grace. She is merely one chosen by God. So this greeting, it's a weird greeting, particularly for her situation. Verse 29, it says she was very perplexed at this statement. That word perplexed, it's, it's related to the same word translated troubled uh, over in, in verse 12 with Zacharias, when the angel came, he was troubled. She was perplexed. They were both confused and scared. Perplexed at this statement, she kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. This was not a howdy y'all kind of greeting. What on earth is this about? The angel says to her, just like he did to Zacharias, do not be afraid. He says, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Again, that word grace with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. 
So she's wondering, what on earth does this mean? And the angel says, don't be afraid, just like he did with Zacharias. But with Zacharias, we saw that the reason he shouldn't be afraid is because God had heard his prayer. He was going to answer his request. Or with Mary, all we see is that God has chosen her. You found favor with God. You found grace in God's eyes. God has chosen you for a very specific reason. Again, there's no idea here of her merit for this, that God has seen all of your wonderful deeds at 10 years old or 14 years old and he's picked you, but it's merely that God has decided in his benevolent grace to choose you. And what he's going to do with you is he's going to cause you to conceive and to bear a son, and you're going to call his name Jesus. Pretty Amazing what's happening here is that he's coming to a young virgin saying you're going to conceive and bear a child whose name, while popular in this day, is very significant in this context, whose name means God saves, Yahweh saves. And he goes on to explain so that we can see the grandeur of this Jesus who she is going to bear. He says, verse 32, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Now it's getting spectacular. Now we're not just talking about an insignificant girl in an insignificant town being told by an angel that God has favored you enough to give you a child, and you're going to call him Jesus, but that this Jesus is nothing short of all the promises of God coming into being in this one child. We read that John is going to be great in the sight of God. In God's sight, John is going to be great. But here the angel just simply says about Jesus, he's going to be great. This unqualified characteristic of Jesus is simply that he is purely, completely greatness. That's who he is. John is called the prophet of the Most High later in Luke chapter 1. Jesus is called the Son of the Most High. John is going to come and and turn people's hearts back to the Lord God, but Jesus is going to be given by the Lord God a throne and a kingdom. And all of this harkens back to the Old Testament where we read about God's promises to David, the faithful king, that God would give to David a son who would rule and reign forever and ever, a throne established in which there will be no end to his Government. Isaiah 9 7 says there'll be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. God is coming to Mary through this angel and saying, I'm going to give you a child, and in this child, all of my promises are going to come to pass. This is nothing short of of God in the flesh. As we pause on this, I simply want to point out to you that God has a plan. And God has been working his plan. The way that this all goes down points us all the way back to Genesis, all the way back to the fall of humanity when we found ourselves cast down into death and enslaved to sin. And God, as he is handing out the curses, promises in 3.15, this most beautiful promise that the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent. And here we see this being played out in the most beautiful poetic way in that you have a virgin conception and the seed of this woman is coming and he's going to crush the serpent. He's going to bring about a rule and a reign that destroys the rule and reign of darkness and evil forever and ever. A rule and reign that will last, that will have no end. This is who Jesus is. This is what he comes to do. This is what God has been planning. And I want you to understand this. While we may look back on this 2,000 years later and be like, yeah, of course, that was God's plan. In their day, nobody saw this coming. They knew that a Messiah was coming. They believed that God was going to send a Savior. But nobody saw it coming, that God himself would condescend to become flesh, that God himself would take on a body and become a man and would live and would die, and not simply die, but die a humiliating, excruciating, unfair, and unjust death on a cross. 
Nobody saw this coming, and yet that's been God's plan all the time. And God has worked out his plan. He's coming to Mary. He's not telling her the ins and the outs of the plan. He simply says, hey, I have a plan, and you're going to be a part of my plan. And this is how you're going to be a part of my plan. Sometimes, oftentimes, God's plan makes no sense to us. God, what God is doing just makes no sense to us. And sometimes we can begin to look at things and wonder if God is in control. Maybe God has lost control. Maybe God's plan is off the rails here. And we need to step back and remember that God oftentimes works in ways that make no sense to us so that when it comes about, we can look at the end result and say, only God could have done something like that. So that's the reality of where we are. God has a plan, and we don't understand his plan, and we don't see how he's working it out, but we're still called to simply trust in his plan. Mary, her grand significance for us is not as she has been casted in church history as some benevolent mother of God. Mary's grand significance to us is her testimony of faith, that when she is told that she's going to bear a child who's going to bring about all of these grand promises of God, she believes it. We're going to see in a moment she doesn't understand it, but she believes it. And I want you to know, my friends, God has a plan. He has a grand plan, a magnificent plan, but he also has a plan for you, a specific plan for your life and what he's going to be doing in your life and where he wants to take you. And you may not understand it. You may not see how it's working. But you're not supposed to understand it. You don't have to see it. God simply calls you to trust that he has a plan. And here's the wonderful thing about his plan. His plan, we already know the end. We don't know how we're going to get there, but we already know the end. His plan ends with every knee bowing to Jesus. His plan ends with every arrogant, blasphemous tongue having to confess him as Lord. We already know how it ends. That his plan ends with his people, with him forever and ever in life and perfection and glory and beauty. We know how it ends. His plan ends with those who reject Christ dying in their sins forever and ever and ever. We know how his plan ends. You may not know how he's going to get you there, but that's okay. You just trust. We can trust in his plan, even if we don't understand it, because we can trust in his power to accomplish his plans. Verse 34, Mary says to the angel, say, what? <laughs> How could this be? I'm a virgin. Now, Zacharias had the same you know, response of, how can I know this is true? And, and you remember, Zacharias, he kind of got slammed a little bit for it, rebuked for a little bit for it, because you didn't believe my word, you will be silent, and he makes Zacharias a sign. Mary does not get rebuked. And it could be that the angel's just being nice to the little girl and harsh on the old priest. It could be, I don't know. Uh, I think, however, it probably is indicative of a different heart that drives the question. Because Mary is not questioning the word that is given to her, she is questioning the possibility. Literally, how will this become, future tense, how will this become since I am presently a virgin? Mary seems to understand that the angel's proclamation about this conception is something that's going to happen pretty quickly. Now, she's engaged, and presumably, she and Joseph are going to have children, and we know scripturally that they did have children. But she does not see that Joseph's going to be the father of this Jesus. She understands that, that the angel is saying is Joseph's not going to be the dad. You're going to conceive quickly. She knows God's not going to call her to commit adultery and go get pregnant somewhere else. So how can this be since I am presently like this? She's not questioning the word. She's simply wondering about the possibility of what she's just been told. I think that's why she's not rebuked the way Zacharias was. Or the angel's nicer too, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. But the angel is going to tell her, verse 35, the angel answered, he said to her, 
The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who is called barren is now in her sixth month. So the angel gives her an explanation and even gives her a sign to confirm to her the value and the, the, the truthfulness of his words. And the explanation, verse 35, is basically the glory of God is going to shadow you and create within you this child. Not procreate. This is not as the ancients often depicted their gods of a god coming down and having relations with a woman and naturally bringing about demigods. Nothing like that. God is not going to procreate with you, Mary, but the glory of God, the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you, and this is going to be a new creation. He is going to form this body in you. It's a good explanation, I, I suppose, I'll tell you, it has left us baffled for 2,000 years on what on earth does that even mean? You, you ever get an explanation where you hear the whole explanation and you're no closer to your answer than you were before the explanation came? That's not quite this. We know that there's not going to be any kind of physical activity that brings about it. It's going to be God's supernatural creation of a body in her. So we do know that much, but we still don't understand how can God take on flesh? How can this happen? How can this physically happen? All sorts of questions that we have about the nature of Jesus, about the genes of Jesus and the DNA of Jesus, all these things, we still don't understand exactly what it means. But she's given this explanation that really is not going to satisfy a skeptic in any way. And then she's given a sign. And it's a sign that proves true. We won't read it, but Mary, immediately she goes to visit Elizabeth. Now, they didn't have Facebook back then. They couldn't post, you know, their gender reveal parties or anything like that back then. And so it seems that Mary does not understand or know that Elizabeth is pregnant. And the angel says she's pregnant. She's in her six months. She's now out of seclusion. And so uh, Mary runs to Elizabeth. She goes to Elizabeth and she finds that what the angel said is true in more than true. Not only is Elizabeth pregnant, but the child in Elizabeth's womb the child that God said would be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in the womb begins leaping for joy within his mother as the Christ child who Mary has already conceived enters into his presence. And she knows in that moment that everything the angel said is absolutely true. Gives her an explanation. Gives her a sign. But my friends, none of that really matters because all that matters is verse 37. Nothing will be impossible with God. The ultimate explanation that God gives us for us to simply accept him at his word is because I'm God. I can say it and do it because I'm God. He doesn't need to explain it to us. He doesn't need to help us wrap our minds around the physical uh, ramifications of what he's talking about. He simply has to say, because I'm God. This phrase, nothing is impossible with God, it, it's a, an awkward phrase in the Greek. It, it's literally, and nothing is without power, any word that comes from God. In other words, Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God has the power to accomplish the purpose God sent it out on. There's not a word of God that lacks power to come true. Our words lack power to come true. My words lack power all the time. God's word does not. And that's all that she needs. That's all Mary needs. Okay, every word that God speaks has the power to come to pass. Well, verse 38, behold the slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word, which she knows is God's word, which has the power to bring about the impossible in her life. And so the angel departed from her. Mary's language here of the slave of the Lord, it, it's indicative of what her heart is in this moment. It's indicative of what faith is we don't like the word slave in our culture, but it's a word that perhaps we need to take back into account with our Christian life because it 
It's language that indicates a complete surrender of one's will and one's life to a superior, to an authority. And this is what slavery is. This is why Jesus says all those who commit sin, or the Bible says all those who commit sin are slaves to sin because we submit our will to an authority that we've placed over us known as sin that brings death. When Mary says, my will is not in this anymore, I don't understand this, but I'm your slave. She's saying, I'm yours, and I trust you. I trust that you have the power to accomplish this impossible thing you've said. I don't get it, but I trust you. Years ago, uh, one of my cousins became a Dallas police officer. So she went through the academy, did all the stuff, and uh, at her graduation, now my cousin, she's a very lovely, petite young lady who has now become a Dallas cop. And my father, uh, her party celebration, my father, from whom I derived my sense of humor, <laughs> looked at her and said, how are you going to take down a bad guy? I mean, look at you. And he wasn't trying to be mean to her. He was trying to be funny, but she looked at him. You know, cops have to be intimidating. They have to really be able to, to handle some, some aggressive individuals, particularly in Dallas. She looked at him. She walked over to him. He flipped him on his back. <laughs> Little, lovely, petite cousin throwing my grown older father on the floor. It was a wonderful thing to see. <laughs> he didn't question anymore whether she could do her job. <laughs> she proved her power to him. I can do it. God often acts in ways that just are crazy. Impossible. To prove that he can do it to demonstrate his power so that when we see it and we hear it, we don't question him, we don't doubt. We simply say, I don't get it, I can't do it, but I trust you can. God acts in ways that baffle us, ways that should not be. He delights in showing us impossibilities and then doing it. He delights in posing before us situations that cannot work out for our good and then bringing it for our good simply to demonstrate his power to us. Listen to me. If the empty grave is all that we had, we would have enough to never doubt the word of God again. And yet God did not simply stop with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Day after day after day, our God has been demonstrating and proving his power to us. And yet we doubt it. We doubt his word. Sometimes we'll, we'll throw human type considerations into it. It's not that I doubt God's word, it's just I doubt myself. I've sinned too much. I've gone too far. How could God forgive me? How could God save me? How could God rescue this nation? How could God do this, that, or the other? And we, we try to encapsulate it around it's a human failure, not a God failure. But what we're saying at the end of the day is still God's word can't succeed here. I want you to hear me. In our arrogance, we strip God's word of its power. But in our arrogance, we fail to realize that there's not a sin you can commit, that there's not an atrocity that we can commit that can overcome the word of God in our lives and in this world. There's nothing we can do to thwart God's plan because there's nothing we can do to contend with God's power. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, he says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. The base things of the world and the despised, God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast. You may not understand what God is doing. You may even question what God's word says about you. 
and have those doubts that come in your mind. But I want to remind you that God is constantly doing the impossible. And if you doubt, it's not God's fault. You have no reason for it, and you need to stop. If God's word says that you are forgiven because of Jesus Christ, believe it. If God's word says that God loved you enough to send his son to die on the cross for your sins, even if you don't feel loved, believe it. If God's word says that if you reject Jesus, you're going to hell for all of eternity and you deserve it, you better believe it because God's word is powerful and will bring it to pass. If God's word says that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, believe it and call on his name. If God's word says that he is faithful to finish the good work he started in us, no matter how messed up we are or how messed up the world is, believe it because God said it. You may not understand it. You may not see how it could possibly ever be. Just believe in the God who delights in performing the impossible for us. Christmas only has true significance when we have faith. The story is true, whether you believe it or not. Jesus came in the flesh, whether you believe it or not. Wasn't on December 25th. Whenever it was, it's true. But it only has value for you when you put your faith in Jesus. If you want Christmas to mean anything to you, then let it be a season of faith. Maybe you don't understand what God has been doing this year. And you can't see how God's plan is truly at work. Trust he has a plan. Maybe you can't see the power of God at work in your life and you don't know that his word could possibly be true for you. Believe in his power. You don't have to see. You don't have to understand. You simply have to trust and obey. Let's pray. Our Lord God, as we consider this amazing announcement to Mary, And how astounding it must have been to her and impossible it must have seemed to her. And yet, you did it. I pray, God, that we would not dare doubt your words to us. You've already shown yourself powerful and faithful and able and willing to save. Forgive us, God, when we doubt your word. Forgive us, God, when we put our words above your word. Help us, Lord to trust. Help us, Lord, like Mary, to surrender ourselves as your slaves, our will surrendered to yours, our way surrendered to yours. And I pray, Lord God, that as we strive to trust in you and to put our faith in you, that you would bless us with peace, with joy this Christmas season. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The Christian life starts with faith. So my question for you this morning is, have you started the Christian life? This morning, if you're sitting here and you have not surrendered your life to Jesus, maybe you walked an aisle, maybe you said a prayer, maybe you've gone to church, but you've not surrendered your life to Jesus and you've not started that faith walk with the Lord. My invitation for you is to do so today. God's word says that he loves you. And his word says that Jesus came to die for you, to take the guilt of your sins upon himself. And God's word says that his death was sufficient for you. If you would simply confess him and trust in him, he will save you. And you may say, preacher, you don't know me. You don't know my sins. You don't know how wicked I have been. I don't need to know you. I just know what God's word says. And I'm calling on you to believe it and to act. 
But maybe for you it's not starting the Christian life, but it's simply you need to remember that the Christian life is always a life of faith. We have to live by faith every moment of every day. Ultimately, we're all dependent on God, and yet in our arrogance, we act as if we're not. My brothers and sisters, I would simply call you to trust God. You may not get it. You may not understand it. You may not feel his presence, or you may not see his hand at work, but he's spoken, and his word has the power to bring it to pass. Do not fear. Do not lose heart. Trust. Christians, let's live by faith that we might know the joy and the peace that Jesus offers. Stand with me and let's sing our song of invitation.